So, um, as I said, we're going to think about the well-being economy, and I'm going to look at supply chains, and most specifically, though, I'm going to look at food, because I think in the end, this is probably what a lot of you are thinking about every day and, and you know, being concerned with. But I'm going to try and weave in <clears throat> a more generic story about if we follow some of the principles of the natural prosperity, which I've mentioned before, you start to look at human behavior in a different way. Now, in this country, we've had lots of conversations about the nudge unit um, policy helping to create the environments which help people change their minds and move towards other things. And what I want to present you with today is a different idea about how we can change behaviors, but it comes from a different social construct. It comes from the idea that we actually have to work at this together. There is no individual action. You're going to have to work together on this to find the right outcome that we're looking for. And that's really at the heart of national, natural prosperity. Natural prosperity is not something you can go out into the wilderness on your own and do. It's actually how you connect with your society, with community. About a year ago, in the midst of the COVID uh, epidemic, I was online with a few people from communities in the Cotswolds. Now, I don't know if you know the Cotswold. It's an area of natural beauty. It's made up of absolutely beautiful, lush, undulating hills. Um, and it was, and remains to some extent, at the heart of the wool industry, a very thriving wool industry. It began in medieval times, for those of you who, who don't come from the UK or don't know so much about UK history. Um, Cotswold wool was the symbol of national prosperity. It was considered the jewel of the realm. And in fact, there was a 12th century saying which said, you know, in Europe, the best wool is English, and in England, the best wool is Cotswold. The Golden Fleece, however, didn't come from the Cotswolds. They think it was actually a long-haired breed, the lion breed. It's got a very heavy clip, if you know anything about wool. Um, and it was brought by the Romans. All right, so you know, no surprises that the Romans brought yet another better thing for us to work with. So even then, you know, things were traded. Wool merchants would travel all the way across from Europe, across the English Channel, to come and buy Cotswold wool. They would take it back to Florence for some of the finest weavers. It was very, very precious textile, you know, sat far above all of the others. And even now today, in um, the Lord Speaker, as you know, in the, in the House of Lords, he sits on something called the wool sack, covered in a sort of red cloth, and that indicates the importance of the wool trade. So if, if you he ever hear the, t the phrase, the wool sack, that's why he sits on it. It isn't a sack, by the way, anymore. Um, so huge wealth going in here. <coughs> supply chains all the way across Europe, and then effectively this wealth built up beautiful wool churches, lovely houses, and so forth. So if you have a chance to go to the Cotswolds, it's, it's absolutely gorgeous. Ships and on Stour, which is my neighboring town, sheep, sheep wash town, as it was probably known from, um, they were really you know, built to, to sort of show off the wealth of the area. And one of the most influential, William Greville, some of you may know him, became a very important person in kind of English politics. So wool was the thing that bought you prestige and position. It was very, very important. Interestingly, at the heart of the wool trade is the worshipful company of Mercers, um, which is the first order in the precedence of you know, all of the, of the city's livery uh, companies. Um, these are the ones that evolved from the guilds and they are there for training. They're under a royal charter. And the company's aim, the, the Mercer, was to literally act as a trade association of general merchants, particularly the exporters of wool, also silk and, and velvet, so all those luxurious fabrics, and also to provide training. Um, this, the, the company also looked after schools. The Mercer School, established a long time ago, 1447. St. Paul's, some of you may have heard of, in 1509. And it founded Gresham College. And that's essentially why we're here, because Barnards Hall is, is essentially the home for what we do, and it came about because of the Mercer's Company. So that's the, that's the story between the wool, the Mercer's Company, and Gresham College. So there's a kind of nice story there. Anyway, out of that period, lots of historians have looked at how supply chains evolved, and what they showed is that right back into Roman times, there's very strong evidence that was literally showing how supply chains built up as trading routes opened up. 
So by medieval times, we had supply chains underpinning society, no question about it. You had the local market, where people would bring things. You had large fairs. And if you look at the documents about what was sold in those fairs, it is absolutely extraordinary. You find um, toys from what is now Russia. You find things from all over the world turning up in these large affairs, even in the medieval times. So these are real sort of tangible evidence of how part of our, the way that we live and the way we think about consumption not production so much, but consumption has to do with prestige, has to do with wealth, of course, but also availability. No point pining after something if you're not going to be able to get it. What also emerged, though, and this is the sort of heart of what I'm going to talk about at that time, is that these fairs and these trading areas and markets were actually organized by the estate owners, by the churches, by town councils. And the whole point of this was so they could extract revenues. So this was essentially the beginning of the middlemen, of the brokers, of the people who kind of slightly parasitized the whole process and to this day actually cause problems in the global south, particularly where if you were to take a simple supply chain, um, let's say in a, in a simple small holding farm in Kenya, you will absolutely find that between the lady that is growing the tomato and the person who actually ends up consuming it, particularly if it's not in that village, there can be as many as five people who are taking their small piece at every point. The problem is that if you only produce two tomatoes, it's quite difficult to bulk that up to get a good price. Now, I'm just going to kind of skip to the end because what happened in COVID was that the five people in the middle weren't allowed to be out and about. The government said, nope, can't travel, got to wear your mask, got to stay at home, and so on. So suddenly, the lady in the farm, she's got her two tomatoes, and she's got her phone, and we have something called M-Pesa. And so you'd call around, and then she'd find, oh, but I can actually sell my tomatoes on my phone. I have two tomatoes for sale. Who'd like to buy them? And that is precisely what happened, was that during COVID, Supply chains got really short, particularly in a lot of developing countries. Lots of people disappeared out of the middle. So ironically, out of all of that, a lot of smallholder farmers are much better off today than they were pro before COVID. So the question is, how do you avoid you know, all of the people crowding back into the middle again? Because it, it could easily happen. So you know, back, into, back to the Cotswolds now. Um, so COVID lockdowns are still going on. And of course, the first thing that went out was tourism. So tourism was pretty much done and dusted and it was over for the whole period of the COVID because people weren't able to get about. And the Cotswolds particularly attract people from overseas, so that all went. So what happened on the call was it quickly turned towards farming and sort of changes uh, in buying patterns and the hope that people would realize that buying locally produced food where they could almost know who had grown it, was going up the agenda. That people were really seeing that being able to get the origin to originate, to source your food, was equally as important as, as the being able to afford and to have the right price. And so the talk was about how could we try to assure in the sort of post-COVID world, if there is such a thing, that that sense of connection in the supply chain wouldn't be lost, that people would value being able to really identify who had grown their food, where it had come from, and being able to be more transparent about the whole thing. So this is all fine, but then of course as lockdowns have begun to fade away, and a lot of the world's population is actually just looking to return to normal, pre-COVID no normal, with a kind of resumption of consumption patterns, which means that you know, you're reigniting this idea of supply chains that provide just-in-time access for anything from anywhere in the world. And that is the danger. So we're at a tremendously important crossroads in the world today. The problem is that the reality is very different. What we're actually seeing is this cascade of changes. So you've got a kind of current context, and then in comes a stressor like COVID, where you've got 
um, you know, all kinds of uh, markets changing because people can't get out there and all the supply chains and so on being broken. But at the same time, you have drought, you have flood, you have major climatic events. So this whole building up of stresses means that there was a lot of market volatility. You have some crop failures, you've got people being displaced, and then you end up having all these different kinds of tipping points. So it's like a cascade, building, 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 which leads you to a lot of food insecurity. So <clears throat> we're seeing major, major sort of disruptions, um, the destabilization of, of global supply chains, not just in food, but in consumer goods. I mean, everyone can read the headlines for themselves. Backlog backlogs at ports like Shanghai, knock-on delays, rising prices of raw materials. Now's the time to be in raw materials if you really want to make a lot of money very quickly. Um, energy, food, and so forth. <coughs> So the challenge is that we've long known about supply dislocations. We've had, for example, scarcities caused by shipping accidents. I mean, like the Ever Given, the ship that got stuck in the Suez Canal. I mean, who would have thought you know, the world was paralyzed because one ship kind of didn't quite get it right you know, and got stuck. So I think there's a, there's a sort of, but there's a sort of, oh, well, we'll get over it. It's not, that, it's not that much of a problem. It's a bit inconvenient, but nothing fundamental is going to happen. But of course now, we have systemic changes in climate. We have extreme droughts, Horn of Africa, and spreading all the way down. We've got floods, and it just goes on and on. Australia is feeling it, everyone is. And then we, of course, add conflicts and wars, such as what's happening in, in the Ukraine and the Russian Federation. So food, which is very short-lived in many cases, it can't hang about, doesn't have a, a long shelf life, is caught up in this perfect storm You've got you know, surging feed and agricultural input prices. You've got extensive crop failures. And you've pretty much got the worst um, disease that, that's out there. So way well beyond, foot, a bit like foot and mouth, but sort of well beyond that. So that's all on one side. But on the other side, you have a cost of living crisis. So your production is really being damaged and the ability of consumers to actually pay for food is also severely damaged. So let's just think a little bit about supply chains themselves. Where do they come from? Um, I mean, obviously, they, they're right at the core of our society. Unwittingly, unknowingly, sort of almost invisibly, they're all around you. I mean, where did you, for example, buy your cup of coffee today? Where did you even buy your ticket? If you actually physically had a ticket to come tonight. It turns out that a lot of the tickets that are produced in this country, the paper does not come from here, of course. It comes from the other side of the world. So literally everything that we're touching is part of a supply chain. So it's made up of organizations, of people, of course, activities, information, resources. And all of that is about providing us, the consumer, with services and with products. The fact of the matter is, though, the supply chains go even deeper. It's not just about shuffling things around the world. They can fundamentally distort the way that we extract from the planet, how we actually take resources. And depending on what happens on the ground, you can see that poorly constructed supply chains can have many, many unintended consequences. So let me give you an example. We have um, a tremendous... Uh, appetite for um, <clears throat> thinking about reducing our meat consumption in some parts of the world. Not everywhere, but in some parts of the world. So you have a lot, a lot, a lot of livestock farmers who are challenged to reduce emissions from their animals. And they do lots of things. I mean, whether you're in Australia, on the big cattle ranches, or, or wherever you are. And, I, and I'll come into that in a little bit. But it turns out there's actually a very simple solution in many cases, which would eradicate approximately 30% of those emissions overnight. And what that is, is if you think about a cow, and you think about what does it eat, well, it's eating grass. So a perfectly tuned cow, and there's quite a lot of research on this now that's coming out, a perfectly tuned cow eating grass and not moved around too much will actually create manure that if you go and test it, and the cow is healthy, and the land is healthy, and this is, the, this is the connection, that if you go and check 
what the microbial community is inside the manure, and you look at the soil microbe, you find out that they're exactly the same. So essentially, a healthy cow on a healthy pasture will have a rumen full of a microbial mix that is actually a true reflection of a healthy ecosystem. If you go and do the same experiment from cows that are industrially produced or where they get moved from pasture to pasture, they get moved around and so on, and they're given a lot of exogenous food, then you find that the manure microbial community is totally different from what is on the grass that they're standing on. And that stress manifests itself in how efficient the rumen actually works, and which is why you get extraordinary levels of emissions from some, actual, um, some, some cattle. So that's not to say whether you should eat meat or not. It's just to say that there's a whole other round of working with planet Earth to actually solve some of our problems. So imagine that you're a consumer and you, you actually do want to have a low-emitting cow. Well, you've got various options. You know, you've got the technology solution. You've got the don't eat it. And you might have the one, well, actually, where are, they, where are you growing your cows? And are they healthy? And is the pasture healthy? And so on. So on that spectrum, there are many, many choices that you can have. And this is the whole point about supply chains, is that they have, in a very superficial way, to accommodate all those kinds of choices. And choices will affect supply chains, but I'm going to make the argument that individual choices actually are an extremely inefficient way of changing the way that we live on planet Earth. So think of supply chains in another way. Think about them as linking values, linking your values. So take anything that you would value in your food and just think about how much you value it and, and how it's grown and, and, and essentially what would you be prepared to do to have that particular food item. And you'll very quickly realize that you're applying value judgment after value judgment. And then you need to ask yourself, well, where has that value judgment come from? Did it come from my head? Did it come from something I read? Did it come from my friends, from my community? Where did I get that value system from? And so lots and lots of exchanges that are otherwise known as supply chains are just literally about one set of values sitting alongside another. Now, there are books and there are courses, and you can take degrees in this. You, know, you can go to business school and you can learn all about this. And you'll learn about you know, brokers and middlemen, and you'll learn about um, all the characteristics of supply chains. They can be functional, efficient, responsive, innovative. There's a whole raft of describing them all. But the key question at the end is the relationship between the buyers and the suppliers and the relationship between those two and the consumer and whether or not it's about reducing efficiencies, delivering quality, delivering the just-in-time. There are many, many decisions that are made in how something magically appears on the shelf for you to buy. So tied up with all of that, of course, and rather unfortunately, is that our choices get jumbled up into what is put on the shelves. So you might think you're making conscious decisions and choices about what you buy. But actually, what you're doing is choosing between what is on the shelf in front of you. Okay? You didn't really set out to describe the world and then say, this is actually what I want. And because of that, many companies and brands are sort of looking at motivations they're playing on your preferences and needs, and they're trying to influence all of that into what's going on in your head internally. And then that will be moderated by the externality of all of this, the availability and so on. So this sounds completely obvious, but, but in fact, when we do experiments and ask people about why they choose to buy certain items, very often it's the case that they do far more spontaneous choice buying than actually considered thinking. And the more you study the way that people make choices around what they buy and what's available, you realize that, whether we like it or not, a vast number of our choices in stores are based on impulse, on emotions, and on habit. So I did it last week. 
It worked out okay, so I'm going to do it again. I bought the avocados. They were really nice. So I'm going to go back. I really like those, you know. And this time they weren't nice, but, but they, maybe they were better than the week before. So I'm going to go back and try again. And so you get into a habit, you know. Oh, oh, oh I always get my avocados from, I don't know where, Morrison's or wherever. So we buy what we know. We choose what we know. And so large corporations are trying to corral us into supply chains, which are easy for them. And this is not a big bash, by the way, of corporations, but it's how corporations have to work because they need to make profits to function. So what they try to do is corral us into a situation where, well, we know it's good because we bought it last week and it was very nice and I'm going to go back and get it again. Behind the scenes, of course, what the companies and global brands are trying to do is to make sure it's efficient, reduce the losses, don't stack things up in inventories and warehouses and get it to you just in time. Okay? So there's a kind of tension here. And it's very important that as we go forward in this sort of post-COVID world, when a few things have got knocked out of shape, that we start to ask questions about the codes, the sort of labeling that we see. And there's, there's many, many things that you can talk about labeling, which is, you know, 343 different kinds of labeling just on the kind of cotton that you can buy. I mean, it, it's, slightly, it's slightly crazy. But you may start to see new kinds of labeling appearing. And that new kind of labeling is, I think, should have a big warning sign on it. It's a labeling that says, <clears throat> we are on a journey to net zero. We are doing nature-based solutions. We are a biodiversity nature positive, And your cotton is doing this, and your whatever is doing that. And having spent the last year and a half looking behind the scenes at the claims, it is absolutely clear that many, many companies are struggling and in a sort of panic because they don't have the evidence to support it. It's not that they don't wish it, it's not that they don't want to do it, but there's a dearth of consistent, scalable measurements that are reliable and that can be tracked transparently around the world. So to say something is ethically sourced, I don't know, what does that mean? I actually don't know what it means. To say something um, has supported climate justice, don't really, I don't really know what that means, but I read it on a label yesterday. Um, and, and yet, a lot, of, a lot of industries are now putting huge demands on facilities, on farmers, you know, subcontracted services, you name it. They're all being asked to sort of deliver to a set of criteria, KPIs or, or different kinds of indicators. But the truth of the matter, and you know, I say that genuinely from, the, from coming from the UN where we have to measure things to sort of show whether countries are making progress, is that there is a shortage of co comprehensive, transparent and robust data that can give confidence to consumers that you're not standing there wondering what on earth it is that you're looking at. On the one hand, we're in this post-COVID or, or sort of tailing out COVID period. There is still COVID around, by the way. But nevertheless, we've sort of come out of that massive public health crisis into a world where the underpinning of supply chains can be rethought. We know we have a planetary debt. We have climate change. We have biodiversity loss. We've got land degradation all going in the wrong direction. And so we are at a crossroads where we can make choices, genuine choices. But on what basis are we going to make these choices? So how can we do this? If we want to regain the resilience of our sort of food supply chains, let's just talk about that for now, and let's make sure there's sufficient food for all and that it is affordable and that it has good nutritional status, how are we going to do that? Well, we need more transparency, first of all. Where's our food coming from? We want to assure that it hasn't traveled necessarily thousands of miles. But at the same time, it isn't always the case that just because it was grown locally, that it's actually high quality. Because if the farmer has used a lot of different chemicals and pesticides and so on, it could very well be that those residues are in the farm produce. Okay, so local doesn't necessarily mean tick, tick, tick. It means it's actually addressed the transportation issue but you need to go and check whether the land is healthy and whether or not the food is, is really uh, what you expect it to be. So when we talk about 
getting back to normal, post-COVID, build back better. For me, it all begs this amazing aptitude that we have, a sort of unfailing aptitude for some kind of organisational and political amnesia about events, where we should really know better and we should be reshaping our world if we possibly can. And I think it comes back to a sort of cognitive overload. So just think about it. We've got real nagging doubts about what we ought to be doing in terms of our impact on the planet's functioning. So there, there's one thing. I don't know if you all sleep well. Actually, I sleep very well. But anyway, a lot of people I know who wake up in the night wake up and they're worrying about the planet, young people especially. Then if you, if you kind of get over that one, then, of course, there's the origins of the pandemic. You know, well, where did it really come from? Is it, it, do we know? And if it is wet markets, should we not address wet markets in the supply chain? Do we really want to have wet markets with live animals, wild animals mixing? Okay, so there's a whole, whole issue about our food supply chain there. As if that's not enough, um, we've got a ton of other things going on with climate and that. And then, of course, you know, we've got conflicts and so forth. So, of course, what we see is an increasing growth of a sort of attitude that, oh, let's leave it all behind, let's just go back to how we were, because it was okay before. But it's actually not an option. It really isn't an option. And I think, because we're in the midst of a severe economic downturn, we're going we're gonna to end up with really desperate times for a lot of people in terms of the enmeshment of food and energy poverty. And, and nobody is going to be, well, very few people will be shielded from this. So I want, to, I want to think about how a theory like natural prosperity could step in. Could. doesn't mean to say it will do, but could step in. So the first thing I've said from the very beginning is about needing to build resilience. So in our choices, we want to make certain that we are not, so to speak, creating perturbations that will have unintended consequences. But we also want to think about our food. So simply saying we want regenerative agriculture is the first step. But what does regenerative agriculture really deliver? Regen is the, it's in the name. The clue is in the name. Regenerative agriculture. So this is agriculture where you can continue growing food essentially forever because you're doing it in a particular way. What does that mean? Well, today, it means no till, so you don't, you don't basically take great big plows and, and pull up the soil. You leave it as much as you can. You do intercropping. You put plants on the ground all of the year round. You never have bare soil because you leave, you know, that would, you know, you lose that. You essentially don't necessarily just fall into the routine of crop rotation because crop rotation will also lose carbon in the soil. So you have to imagine that the soil is like your skin. The top 30 centimetres, that's where it's all happening. And if you don't look after the top 30 centimetres, you will not sequester carbon in the land. So effectively, you have to treat it as it is, a sort of fragile skin that needs to be well tended and well taken care of. And if it is healthy, you will produce not only good food and maybe less farting cows, but you will also sequester carbon from the atmosphere because a highly productive soil, a healthy soil, in this country can trap somewhere in the region of four to eight tons per hectare. So that's quite a lot. Now, where I live in Kenya, um, we can trap somewhere like 180 tons per hectare. So if you want to solve the world's problem of carbon dioxide, you can go to the Amazon and you can go to sort of a whole swath of countries across the, the middle part of the world. But still, it's a very respectable thing to be able to trap, you know, maybe up to even 10 tonnes per hectare in a temperate region like this. So these are the kinds of questions we should be asking our farmers. Yes, you grew our food, but, but could you tell me how many tonnes of carbon you were able to trap whilst growing your food? And I know several farms, the Duchy of Cornwall's farms and others, that are able to achieve these kinds of figures. So if they can do it, many people can do it. All, right? all the way across you know, the way we grow our wheat and so on. So these are the kinds of little taglines that you need to look at because if land is managed in a way where its resilience isn't knocked off course, then you get everything. You get good food and you get carbon. So you can have it all. That's the point. You can, if you do these things carefully, you can have it all. The second thing is about using recursive social processes. 
So recursive social processes, what on earth are they? Well, here's what social practice theory tells us. Social practice theory is about picking up actions, everyday actions, and just doing them again and again and again. And eventually, they become what we know as social structures or norms. So they reinforce and so on. So to give an example, um, you might have practices that are not gender discriminatory, okay? Less racial or gender, gender discrimination. And you keep on doing it, you keep on doing it, keep on doing it, and it reinforces, it's recursive. Until you get to a point where the norm is that it's just not acceptable to have racial prejudices, to have gender discrimination. And it's that recursion that is incredibly important. And it's what natural prosperity for me is all about. How can we instigate the kinds of actions which you can see done again and again in different contexts, in different contexts, but they're done again and again. And this is why I say, you're never gonna, we're never going to solve our problems individually. Because, you know, you might be out there on your own doing this recursively, basically talking to yourself. That's not going to solve the problem. So the final sort of piece about all of this is you need to report back to society. You need to be part of a community. You need to give feedback. So that recursiveness empowers you and has a responsibility to tell your friends, to tell your community, to talk to people, oh, this worked, this is how it works. Now, again, that sounds totally trivial, but amazingly, in social um, practice theory, it's, it's continuously coming up against the challenge, which is that we talk a lot about what can I do? You know, what are the actions that I can take? And you often feel that, so I often feel, I get asked questions, what can I do that will make a difference? Actually, what you can do is get all of your friends together and do the same thing and actually repeat it. And, oh, and then do it again and do it again and do it again with more communities. Small things, yes. So again, this recursive process is about how we can make behavioral change because it becomes just second nature. Interestingly, in a lot of indigenous peoples, that is exactly how they adapt to new things. They try it out, seeing is believing. Someone else tries it out, then they try it again. But because it's always done inside a community, you get reinforcement very, very quickly. And it's why, in some indigenous um, populations, new innovative ideas that work get literally overnight. They move very, very quickly. It's because the community structure is intact. It isn't about one single farmer trying. So when I look at regenerative farming in places like Australia, like in the US, now more and more in Europe, I continually bump into and talk to farmers <clears throat> who are regenerative farmers. They're doing a great job, but their frustration is they can't persuade their neighbors. There's, sort of <clears throat> there's a sense of, I'm doing it on my own. And only now, after in some cases 30 years of doing regenerative practices, are people beginning to see Oh, oh, actually, that is the right thing to do. That's a good thing to do. And my yields aren't going to go down, and I'm going to make a profit. Oh, and I'm also going to store carbon, and so on and so forth. So Ellen Orstrom, who's a, a Nobel Prize winner in economics, she wrote uh, a very, really, really lovely um, book on collective action and the evolution of social norms. And that's what she talks about. She talks about agency and the action situation. And at all levels of government, all levels of society, it's about who you connect to. In fact, there's a, very, there's a really important uh, book, which I love to read again and again, which is called Who Do You Think You Are? And it was written by Sir Michael Marmot, and he did a famous study called the Whitehall Study. And what he did was he took a whole bunch of civil servants who, to all intents and purposes, were very, very similar. They had, you know, their pay scale was quite similar, very similar sort of outlooks. So you could salami slice them, literally. You know, they were very similar to each other. However, if you did salami slice them and gave one of them, you know, like a hat stand or a dustbin, oh, you know, everyone's looking over. Oh, what did they do to get the hat stand? How'd... And this was, the, this was what he discovered, was that the tighter packed people are, the more uh, sort of angst they have about their neighbors but that in the round, they're able to actually produce a cohesive outcome. And so what he studied was life expectancy. So the richest people he looked at were often, like you know, bankers and others, 
on their own, you know, maybe sitting in Canary Wharf with a quarter of a million pounds in the bank, nice happy life on their own, and then with a, a lady in a village, you know, chairman of the knitting club, and guaranteed she would have a life expectancy that was going to be a lot longer than the individual because of that community persuasion, because of the community in which she was working. And there is absolutely clear evidence that that is the case. So if we want to change behaviours, it's not about nudging. It's not about small individual movements. It's about the collective coming together as communities and doing recursively things again and again. So that's actually what social practice theory does. It sort of sets up this contingent view of the world. It's not black and white. So people like um, uh, uh, Pierre Bourdieu, um, uh, Anthony Giddens, Michael, uh, Michel Foucault, people like that, they've been talking about this, but they've done it from a very theoretical point of view. And what I'm trying to do is say there's a very practical, realistic way of how we would do things in the world. So the recursive is a, a two-way process because you can see this thing goes round and round and round. And you need to have dissonance, because otherwise you won't have transformative change. So you do need to have people asking questions, but then you coherently need to agree on what we're going to do. And that's unfortunately where we are today with the warfare between Ukraine and Russia. We haven't arrived at that moment where the recursive action has become strong enough for us to act. It's almost like we don't have the military structures with strong enough muscles because we haven't been rehearsing, we haven't been using them in the way that they're going to be called upon right now. Um, so let's look at food and let's ask the fundamental question. Many people want to change their diets. You hear about veganism, you hear vegetarianism and so on and so forth. And there's all sorts of reasons why people make those choices and those are personal choices. I know lots of families now where one person is a vegan and then this person is a uh, Piscivore, and then this person is a vegetarian. I mean, the, the mothers are going crazy, and the fathers cooking all these different dinners. I mean, it's absolutely bonkers. But nevertheless, that's where we are. Families with you know four or five different choices all going on. Okay, that's choice, but that's not going to shift the dial. That isn't going to shift the dial. If everybody's eating different things, they all feel okay. I get on with my life, and you know, but that's not going to change things. What's going to change things? Well, I think storytelling, community storytelling, and seeing what other people do. And now this is where it gets slightly controversial because I often think that social media creates echo chambers and people just same people talking to people. But actually social media can open your eyes to see what other people are doing. And there's nothing more um, exciting than looking at what people eat. Okay, this is a, I've shown this once before in another lecture, but I just love it. <laughs> Okay, so this is a typical family in the United Kingdom. It's a bit dated. It is a bit dated because I recognise all these sweets and biscuits. I'm not sure if everybody in the room does, but anyway, I recognise them. And so this is a wonderful picture of a typical family's uh, consumption. The dog is doing very well here, by the way. <laughs> very well. Okay. So let's flip to the other side of the world, to our family in Ecuador. And this is what a family in Ecuador is eating for a week. So totally different, all right? Totally different. And when interviewed, um, this family are very happy. They feel very prosperous. They have all this food, and they know where it's come from, and they've got it from their neighbors, and they went up the mountain to get this, and they went down to go and get the, they went up to get the potatoes, down to get the, to get the quinoa, and so on. So effectively, you've got alternatives, and you have choices. So here in Bhutan, you know, there's, there's choices are made. And I see that all the time where I live uh, in the Maasai. Choices are made. People will do without food for several days because they want to, for example, buy a goat for a family that's going to have um, a wedding or some kind of ceremony. But it's not seen as a negative. It's seen as a positive way of contributing to the well-being of others. But, you know, this is the choice of this family. Now, it's not as if, because I happen to know where they are, it's not as if they couldn't get pizzas. Actually, you can get pizzas in Bhutan, definitely. Um, but, but you see, this is the choice. So think about the choices that you've made in your house about the food that you're eating. So these are your choices. Nobody forced you. You want to be a vegan? Nobody's forcing you, necessarily. So I think this is the, the issue for me. But having made those kinds of choices, then there are consequences. So... 
The actual individual consumption, and let's say we're going to use GDP for now, the AIC is the, is the magenta color, and the GDP is, is the sort of blue color. So <clears throat> what you see is that Ireland has got the second highest recorded one, but the, uh, but the UK, which is here, okay, has a higher actual individual consumption. Now, what does that mean? Well, the analysis behind this graph initially was just statistics. You know, it was just what, what were people eating individually and how did that link to their GDP? It turned out that as people got more and more interested in these kinds of data, they ran another set of criteria, which was how big was the family in which the individual was consuming? It turns out that the larger the family, the smaller the individual consumption. And literally, it was showing more and more that is decoupled from GDP. So what you eat and what you choose to eat is as much what the community, your family, the people around the table are eating. And that forces your choices, and that's making your choices. And when asked whether or not it's the famous basket of goods or not, it was more than likely that the, the, the group decision had far less environmental impact than when you had individual choices, notwithstanding packaging. So it would appear that there was a group pressure on how people actually perceive the food that they're eating and where it comes from, asking questions and so forth. So let's go to meat production. So meat production by region, as you can imagine, in Asia it's very high, Europe's not doing, you know, uh -huh. this is a little bit old, but actually the numbers have continued uh, and you, know, you can sort of see North America and so on. So Asia is the really big meat eater in all of this. Didn't used to be, but in the last sort of two decades, it's absolutely skyrocketed. If you look at it per capita, yes, you do have very high levels here, but you've also got massively high levels here per capita. So essentially, there's a mismatch in the supply chains between the individual consumption and the production. So we're actually really very wasteful in how we produce meat versus what we consume. So effectively, there is a, there's a sort of dialogue to be had that it is not necessarily that it's good or bad to eat meat, but you have, to, you have to think about where the meat is coming from. You have to think about how it's produced. Because it's not bad culturally in many places. In fact, it's quite the opposite. So again, it's a cultural choice, absolutely. And it shouldn't be mixed up with an environmental choice. Because meat eating doesn't necessarily have to have the footprint that in many cases it's claimed to be. Now, you may make a choice, a cultural choice, that you do not wish to eat meat because of animal distress, for a variety of reasons, a variety of reasons, religious, cultural, and so on. But it is a mistake to simply use the environment and the footprint as the argument for not eating meat. Because again and again and again, we can show that that isn't the case. And why is it? It's also to do with portion control. So if you take per capita consumption now, per capita consumption, and look what's happened in the last you know, few decades. So in the 1960s, in the USA, 20 kilos has gone up to 43 kilos per capita consumption, right? So, and, this, and it's also shifted from red meat, now there's more poultry, up from 25% in the 70s, and more fish. In India, threefold increase in GDP, no increase in meat consumption, because vegetarianism is what two thirds of the population do. UK, we had a big shift to plant-based foods. People drinking oat milk, uh, there's a whole raft of things. Plant-based foods have taken off, and in fact, yes, there is a savings, but when people are interviewed as to why they're eating plant-based foods, now it's not just about environmental conditions. It turns out that for a large portion of people, it has to do with health. It has to do with their gluten intake. It has to do with many other issues. And quite a lot of people are intolerant to many of the things that have turned up in meat products. But one third claim to have stopped eating meat, and two thirds are eating less meat. 
So again, there's other things coming in here. There's health issues coming in here, as well as environmental concerns, cultural concerns, and so on. So all of these decisions around food have to do with not just simply black and white, but also portion control. And why are you doing it? What's motivating you? So think about hamburgers. You know, 20 years ago, this was the size of a hamburger. In 2012, it was that. I have to say, it has actually gone up even more. I couldn't find it. I, I, was, I was almost going to walk into McDonald's and take a photograph, but I thought I might get arrested, so I decided not to do that. Because the people, the people who made that complaint sort of spent 10 years fighting uh, to, the, to the high court in Europe, so I didn't want to go there. But anyway, understanding our choices um, is, is as much about self-discipline and portion control. So let's get to the sort of last bit then about food, because... Um, what Cass Sunstein said, he's a really well-known political scientist, he said, improbable social movements have got traction and they've become mainstream because you, you basically cause people to have convictions, but they can't, you can't have a conviction on your own. You literally have to have a conviction with other people. And we know that. And we know that's got to be sort of uh, the, behind what we're doing. Thinking, reinforcing, you know, forcing, reinforcing convictions to catalyze action. And this is exactly what's happening with plant-based foods. But if you really want to tackle the food chains, the supply chains, you have to tackle food waste. That's actually the criminal side of all of this. It's not really about what people eat. It's about how much we waste. 27% of food is wasted before it even gets into the stores in this part of the world. 27% doesn't even make it off the farm or into the, into the shops. Food waste in Kenya is much less. In Africa, it's, you know, it's, it's pretty low. However, it spoils very quickly. So you might get it to the shop, but then because of the heat and the humidity and so on, it spoils. And there's very, very little infrastructure to hold food, which is why aflatoxin is spreading and why you know, a lot of grains and others are, are, have to be destroyed. So nowhere is doing particularly well. Um, you know, apart from maybe Oceania, but they don't have very much, and Australia and New Zealand. But essentially, food loss is the, big, is the big baddie in the room when it comes to food supply chains. We lose about 300 million tonnes of food every year. So a tonne of fish is about half, a quarter of this room. That's a lot of food that we're losing. That's just industrials, industrialised countries. So this loss is causing food to become more expensive in the supply chain because you have to make up and recoup the losses, the financial losses as well. And so in the end, if you just took the waste, literally if you took the waste, you could feed 870 million people. So, you know, that's, that's kind of like the food problem. And as things get more expensive, you know, we cannot afford to have a supply chain where you know, up to one third of it is lost and not actually finding its way into the stores. So what to do? So I want to take a kind of sidestep very quickly, and it's about recycling, the circular economy. So part of the food waste solution is to stick the food waste into bioenergy plants. All right, so, you know, we've caused a problem, so let's make a solution, let's burn it. Right, that's a really good idea. But now you've got to ship it, you've got to put it in a truck, and you've got to get it to the food station, the, 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 the energy place, to burn it. All right? So, you know, that might be the point of last resort, but it isn't. We have policies all over, all over the world, here in this country as well, where all food waste, as much as possible, is not put into landfill, of course, but it's taken over for bioenergy. But there shouldn't be any waste in the first place. That's the point. So we've sort of created a, a sticking plaster for a problem that shouldn't be there. Okay, so that's one issue. But it comes back to the whole idea of supply chains and which sort of natural prosperity tries to tackle, which is that in the circular economy thinking and the bioeconomy thinking particularly, we are trying to make the best use of the raw resources that we have. And once we've put them into the economy, into supply chains, what we then try to say is, let's design things in such a way that they can be reused and recycled and all of those things, right? Whether it's 
um, metals or wood or paper and whatever. Paper, 14% gets recycled a year in the world, 14%. Plastics, 4%, all right, so that's a disaster, but we, there's another whole thing going on there. Whereas metals, iron, and all of that is up in the 70, 80, 90%. Because it has value and people can understand it, and it's got real longevity, okay, so people can make arguments about that. But in a sense, the right to repair is what we're talking about here. You have a right to have food where you don't have to take this into your cognitive dissonance, worrying about how much waste has been created to get you the food in the store. So we go back to labeling. What I would like to see is food labeling that tells me that in producing this avocado, we only created, you know, like 10 grams of waste as opposed to several kilos of waste. So these are the kinds of questions that consumers and you kind of need the answers to, because you would like to know, I hope, how food is actually brought to you. Is it healthy? Is it creating losses? And what is the impact of it? All the way through that supply chain, not just how many food miles, not just you know other things you might want to talk about, but the whole supply chain, the waste that's created and so forth. So again, if you look at commodities, um, look at the food losses with things that we all think are really good to eat, roots, tubers, and oil-bearing crops. Unfortunately, they have the highest levels of food loss associated with them. Um, cereals and pulses, unfortunately, this is going up because of climate change. Fruit and vegetables very high. Meat and animal products not quite so high and other. So again, different categories of things that we think are really good for us are putting a huge burden on the planet because of all the waste. So we put all that effort in, we put all those inputs in, we use all that land, we use all that water, we move things out, we destroy biodiversity to grow all these things, and yet we say they're the healthy option. Mm. Okay, so think about that one again. Um, so the circular action, uh, the circular, circular economy, is about thinking in the round, and for supply of consumer goods, it's about the right to repair. And certainly, I mean, uh, President Biden has said quite a lot about this. He issued an executive order actually encouraging the federal government and trade commissions to allow, to allow the right to repair of digital devices. And so finally, and hopefully now it'll continue, Apple and Microsoft are now both committed to it. So there's nothing simpler than changing the keyboard, changing the screen. And so it's been a matter of great resistance. So the right to repair is in the same principle as all of the things I've been talking about, supply chains. Okay, so you have a right to repair. The UK regulation has now been brought in and there is a right to repair. What that means is that you have a choice and you can exercise that choice, which means that if you want your car repaired, you can take it to the Peugeot garage, but you can also, supposedly, go to this garage and all of the parts should be made available for that garage. So it's a nonsense, by the way, if you buy an e-vehicle and you, you're told that only one place can fix it. Nah, nah, nah. Right to repair. So consumer rights, yes, they're hard fought for, but they're not going to be the right kind of consumer rights unless we think in this more holistic way, unless we think in the round. And I'll leave you with sort of one couple of pictures. How we make choices, that's also changing. You know, there are lots of policies, there are lots of communications about products. We can do a lot of online shopping, but how many of you stop to think whether you can repair the thing that you're buying online and you want to look at it and check it out? So, you know, there's much less self-regulation and actually that's what we need. We need more self-regulation so that we can actually understand what it is that we're participating in when we go into our next purchases online. So knowing the consequences of your choices is extraordinarily important. And the so final thought I want to leave you with is that we can solve things piecemeal, bit by bit by bit. But every time something falls off the table out of a supply chain, it has, and it, it has the danger of becoming a conflict material. Because resources are so hard fought after, whether it's plastics or diamonds or whatever, they will become the conflict materials of the future. Because resources are in steep decline, therefore, if it's not thought about, and it falls into sort of the black economy, 
guarantee somebody will buy it and it'll appear back in the economy in a different guise. So conflict materials, no matter what they are, metals, tungsten, you name it, these are the things that are the consequences of not paying attention to our supply chains. But you can't do it on your own. We have to do it collectively. You have to think about it, but you have to allow choices, of course. But think about the choices. They don't always appear as they seem as they appear. There's not always just one simple answer. This is bad for the environment. Eh, maybe just go and look behind the scenes and think a little bit more about it. So I hope that's left you with a few thoughts. I know I've used up a lot of my time, but um, hopefully we've still got time for a couple of questions, I hope. Thank you. All right, well, thank you very much. Thank you. Who is putting green supply chains into practice? And who is looking after our soil as well? Um, this is not an advert for whom I have any vested interest, but please go and look at Good Earth Cotton. So Good Earth Cotton, Australian company, working with very difficult soil, has rebuilt the soil and now uses only less than 10% of what any other cotton produces in terms of water. And they have now put a little thread in their cotton from the $100 bill. So when you buy a pair of jeans in, I don't know, H&M somewhere, and it says Good Earth Cotton, you know exactly which field, and you know the soil conditions, and you know the soil organic carbon, and you know how much water it's used. That's what we need. We need more of those. The comment is that when I went to Germany, one of the things that struck me is the number of consumers who are looking at the contents, you know, for fat and salt and the things. I'd not seen that at all in Britain. So I don't know whether there's a cultural or national difference there. The question I wanted to ask you, I've heard it said, and I have no idea whether it's true, but you know East Africa extremely well. People tell me that a lot of... Um, people working in the agricultural sector, they're growing a lot of flowers, in fact, to be flown to mm -hmm. Britain and other mm -hmm. parts of mm -hmm. Europe, whereas basically it would be better if they grew food for the benefit of their own communities. I don't know whether there's any truth in that. Term. It is absolutely true that in East Africa, Kenya, it's a massive flower industry. It actually keeps many thousands of people in full employment and good employment but it's having a massive impact on, the, on Lake Naivasha, which is where a lot of this happens. And so there are questions asked, and during COVID, because people didn't buy flowers, I'm sorry to say they didn't buy flowers, neither did they buy Kenyan beans uh, and many other products, then a lot of people left the flower growing locations and went back to their farms. And a lot of them stayed. Lots of people left the city they went back to their family farms and they've stayed there. They've not gone back. So, yeah, I just wanted to talk about the Soil Association yeah. and also about woofing. I don't know if how many people in the audience know about woofing. So woofing stands for, did stand for <laughs> willing workers on organic farms and now got changed to worldwide, worldwide opportunities on organic futures because farming actually refers to rent mm -hmm. rather than growing things. Um, and it's a body that um, has allowed people from the city to go out and get involved in organic, no-dig methods uh, for free, yeah. essentially, for board and lodging. So, really, the answer, I think, would lie with those people who've devoted their lives, very often, to developing no-dig methods. I have a friend who was living um, north um, or south Somerset, has moved to Glastonbury. And about 15 years ago, I helped take down a greenhouse that was going to be destroyed that used to provide uh, flowers uh, for this country mm -hmm. and has had um, that greenhouse, uh, which is about a third of an acre or two thirds of an acre, in storage for about uh, six, seven years before we could get the land, uh, had a massive battle with the local council in order to get the thing up and is now producing a huge amount of vegetables for that local um, community. So on no-dig practices, Completely. which he's been uh, practicing for maybe 30 years. Can I just say something about Woofing? I, I think you've kind of captured in a very simple example what I was talking about, which is that 
by dint of being a group of people going to a place, you've, create, you've started to create the kinds of communities that will have impact. What needs to happen, though, is that they need to be recognized inside the, the, let's say, the whole supply chain because their efforts are helping to bring food you know, in, into, into the marketplace. And I think that the challenge we have is that not enough people have that personal experience. They don't get out and they don't see how, the, 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 essentially, how food is grown. And so there is, a, there is a sort of salutary tale in how farmers today are really struggling to keep some of the farms under good production because they don't have enough people. But they don't feel that there's an access point to have volunteers to come out. So, I mean, I would strongly suggest that you do much to promote the idea of people volunteering, but maybe in exchange, you know, you have some food that comes back with you because there's nothing like learning how you grow food for yourself. I think that's a tremendous thing to do. Tremendous. Thank you very much. Um, ladies and gentlemen, I'm afraid we are going to have to uh, wind up. But I'm sure Professor McGlade will remain rooted I to the will. podium I will. and you can go and speak to her afterwards. But um, can we just say thank you for another fascinating and very stimulating lecture? Thank you.